you can take the whole the whole thing can go back. That's okay. You may be wondering what's going on. Someone wonder if there was a garage sale today. We are not having a garage sale. <coughs> My wife, for the last two years, has been giving me a hard time that I don't use enough object lessons. So what I figured I'd do is I'd catch up for the last two years in one sermon. That way, if I don't use them in future sermons, you can't be upset with me because I've already got a status quo. But we're going to walk through today the story of the whole Bible. And we've been focusing on, on Genesis, and we've been walking through the life of Abraham, but a lot of what happens in the life of Abraham is a foreshadow. I mean, it's pointing forward to Jesus, so I thought today what we can do is just give the whole picture. So let's uh, go in prayer again. I love it when we pray a lot during the service, and we'll get into God's Word. Dearly Father, thank you that you are good, that you are unfailing. And God, there may be people in here right now that question that. Maybe they're in the midst of the thick of it and they're going, I don't know if I trust you, God. God, but we today we share this story to see the big picture, to know that we can trust you, that your ways are perfect. And so God, be with us as we open your word and dive into it today. In your name we pray, amen. Well, going back to before time even existed, God existed in perfect unity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that anytime you use an object, you're going to confess heresy, but we see that the Father is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, but all three are God, one essence. And God existed in one essence, one perfect essence, three eternal beings, and He didn't need anything from us. And there's a a popular praise song that the rest of the song is really good, but there's one line in the song that said, you didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. But the reality is that before heaven existed, before, before before God created all these things, God didn't need us. But His wonderful mercy and His plan, He created us. And and he, He didn't create us out of some need to have someone to join Him, but out of His glory. So God eternally existed three in one, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he decided the best sport is baseball because he said in the big inning, in the big inning, no, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. We see The Father and the Spirit there in that initial sense. Later, God is going to say, let us make man in our own image, all three persons in the Trinity. And in the New Testament, we we see that through Jesus, everything that was made has been made. All three persons of the Trinity were active in creation. And and day one was light, and, and God separated the light and the day, and the light He called day, and the dark He called night. Day two, he separated the waters, and so there were waters below and waters above, and that may be one of the reasons why people lived so long before the flood, before the atmosphere changed when all that water came down. And then we have day three, and we have the land and the sea and the plants and the fruit that God created. And he separated the land from the water, and that's where we get oceans and those kind of things. And then day four, we have the sun, moon, and stars. Joshua drew this for me yesterday. Uh, He was really bummed because he didn't have time to color it. He did has one in his room that has colors and all sorts of stuff, but nevertheless. Then day five, we have birds and fish. And this is a live fish free to anybody who grabs it after the service. Our guppies keep having babies, and we don't know what to do with all of them, so you can feel free to take that, free to whoever gets it first. And then day six, he created land animals and man. And I thought, you know, I don't know if there's ever been a dog with an afro, but if you've seen some of the dinosaurs, it's possible that dogs had afros back then. I'm just saying, when I was a youth pastor in Philly, our, uh, our band uh, would all wear afros, and we'd come out on stage, and the first, the first song, I came out and hit the guitar note, my afro flew in the first front row, and it was gone forever. That was actually, it was symbolic, that's why I started losing my hair, but... Um, <laughs> But so someone gave me that gift. And so day six, God created the animals and, and man, and, and then day seven, he rested. I think sometimes as, as Christians, we don't see the principle that God even, even God stops to rest. And we need to stop and, and rest 
and be with God. And everything was good. And, and God looked at his whole creation and all that he created was good. And, and man and woman, Adam and Eve, they, they dwelled with God. And God would come and walk with them in the garden. It was this perfect relationship. But then one day, the serpent came. And much like Satan does today, Satan said, look, God's holding out on you. I know you're enjoying all this and there's nothing wrong here, but but if you would just eat from this one tree. I know God said you can do anything you want here, just can't eat from this one tree. But but you know what? If you eat from that tree, you'll really be like God. And today, to this day, Satan still tempts us with that same thing. He offers us things that fulfill temporarily, but they're all lies. If you just had that job, if you just had that boyfriend or girlfriend, if you just had that stuff, then everything would be great. This stuff will be better than than what God has for you. But just like back then, it was a lie. So Adam and Eve took the fruit and they ate it. I'm pretty sure it wasn't a banana because they're gross. Bananas are really, they're the worst fruit of all the fruits. I know some of you guys like them in the morning and they have potassium and other things, but really you eat it and you're like, I need, it needs peanut butter or something. You need to add something to it. But the reason why I chose a banana is because it doesn't say they ate the apple. It says they ate the fruit. And everybody always uses an apple. We don't know. See, I found a picture. There's an apple. Why? I don't know what the fruit looked like. It could have been a square fruit. Who knows? That would have been interesting. But whatever the fruit was, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God said, if you eat from it, you will die, and they, and they ate. And because they ate, sin entered the world. Because they ate, they were separated from God. And immediately they realized they were naked. And so when God came down to walk with them, and as he did, they hid. And God said, where are you? Not because he didn't know where they are, but he always asked good questions and And Adam says, I I hid because I'm naked and I'm ashamed. And God said, well, how do you know you're naked? Well, we ate from the fruit of the tree. And so God in his judgment said, okay, well now, you know, because you did that, you are going to die. There was a spiritual death that happened, eventually a physical death. Also, ladies, you can thank Eve for the fact that childbirth hurts. That was part of that process. It makes work became difficult. We can thank Adam for that. And then also relationships between husband and wife were strained, and we can thank them for that. But right there at the very beginning, two really important things happened. One, a promise was made that an offspring, through through the offspring of Eve. It says in Genesis 3.15, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and this woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. There's a promise that we later learned is the coming Messiah of Jesus. See, God knew before even the foundation of the world that that mankind was going to mess up and he was going to have to send his son to die in our place. And so from that very first sin... God said, I'm going to provide for you. But not only that, I'm going to cover your sin and your shame. And so God killed an animal, and God took the the fur of the animal, and he, he covered their sin and shame. He created clothes for them so they were no longer naked and ashamed. In that very first sin, there was a sacrifice to cover the sin and shame. But then... The world didn't get any better. In fact, it continued to get worse. Cain killed Abel because God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain's. And the world got worse and worse. In Genesis 6, it says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil at all time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. I was trying to figure out how do I, in a picture form, demonstrate Horrific sin. (laughs) Anyways. It's not true, but... uh, But it had gotten so bad that there was no one righteous other than Noah. He was the only one left. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. Does it mean he's sad that he made them because he knew God's redemptive plan? He's just saying, I'm so pained, I'm so hurting about this. But there was one man who was righteous. It says 
in Noah 6, 8, or Genesis 6, 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. And so God told Noah to build an ark. And I don't know how Noah became a marine, but I guess it kind of makes sense. And, uh, and so Noah built an ark, and it took a long time, and then he got animals two by two, every kind of animal, and then he also had seven pairs of the clean animals that would be for sacrifice, and he got them on the boat, and then God caused the waters they would separate into the sky to come down and flood the earth. Forty days, forty. we're not going to have the sermon that long, it's not going to be forty days and forty nights. People would probably leave eventually. But God flooded the whole earth. And then after the flood, Noah's family was saved and, and they came and, and they landed on the land and they made a sacrifice. And, and in verse 14 of Genesis 9, God makes this covenant to Noah. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rain to appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all of life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on earth. And so God made a covenant with Noah, and the rainbow, which has been hijacked in our culture, was a covenant between God and man that he would never again flood the whole earth. But then as time went on, uh, people didn't necessarily get a whole bunch better, and so the whole world had one language, and as they were supposed to go and scatter, there was this group of people that said, no, we don't want to scatter. We're going to settle here, and we're going to build a tower to heaven so we can be famous. And so what God did is God realized what they were doing, and so he confused their language. So I have the tower here, and I have a picture of my wife because uh, women are confusing sometimes, and sometimes we speak a different language. So anyway, so God confused their language I, I proved that before. She's not here today, but I actually ran that one by her. She thought it was funny, so it's okay. Um, but God confused their language, and that's where language originated. And so we had all these people separating. They couldn't understand each other, all these different languages. And then we come to the story that we've been in for the last number of months. God chose Abraham to start a nation. He chose Abraham and said, through you, all nations will be blessed. In Genesis 12, he says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. In 15, he affirms the promise, including the land blessing. He said his descendants will be as the stars are in the sky or as the sands are on the shore. And he even predicted that the Israelites would end up in Egypt for 400 years. And Genesis 17 affirms that promise again. In Genesis 22, there was this promise of the seed through the offspring of Abraham that through his offspring all men will be blessed, looking forward to Jesus, that through Jesus all will be blessed. And we have another foreshadowing event. God told Abraham to take his one and only son, Isaac, his, his son of prom, the son of promise from Sarah. He said to take, her up, take him up and to sacrifice him to God. And Hebrews said that Abraham had so much faith that he believed that even if he had killed Isaac, that God would raise Isaac from the dead. He believed that God would create a substitute. And when he was getting the knife ready to kill his son, there was a ram, I don't have any rams, but this will do, a ram in the thicket. God provided a sacrifice in the place of Isaac. In the place of his one and only son. We'll get back to that because God is foreshadowing a different moment that will come. And then later we see God told Rebekah that the promise would come through Jacob. And then God affirms the covenant to Isaac in 26. And God affirms the covenant to Jacob in chapters 28, 32, and 35. And we see time and time again that the seed, that through their offspring, all men will be blessed. Pointing to Jesus. Time and time again. There will come a time. If you remember the situation with, with, Joseph, or with Jacob, he had four wives. Rachel was the one he wanted to marry in the first place, but got tricked. And then Rachel's firstborn son was Joseph. And Jacob thought Joseph was his, well, he, Joseph was his favorite because she was the firstborn of Rachel. And Rachel had passed away, and he probably looked at her and, and saw his wife in, his, in the eyes and the features. And, and so he made this beautiful technicolored coat 
It's, it's not technicolor, but this beautiful, colorful coat. Much different than this. It would have had lots of different colors. And Joseph, when he was 17, had two dreams. And the first dream was that all of his brothers would bow down to him. And so he told his brothers, because that's what a good 17-year-old does. Hey, hey, guess what, guys? <laughs> Someday I'm going to be chilling. And you're going to be like, ha, ah, and be like, woo -hoo. And they're like, uh, you're a jerk. And then after that... <laughs> He had another dream that not only were his brothers bowing down, but his father and mother would bow down too. And after that dream, the, the brothers plotted against him. And his father sent him out to where, where the brothers were tending their sheep and, and to get a report back. And, and they saw him coming. They said, let's kill him. But they were worried about the consequences. And, and Reuben, who was a trickster, who was hoping to get back in the favor of Jacob, of Israel, uh, he said, no, don't kill him. Throw him into this pit. So they threw him into the pit. And then another brother said, hey, instead of killing him, why don't we sell him off? Why don't we get something for him? So they sell him off into, as a slave. And they, they take off his robe and they put animal blood on it and they take it back to, to Israel, to Jacob. And he thinks his son is dead. And he mourns. And he said he's going to mourn until the day he dies. But God had a plan. So Joseph went through a long season of waiting. He, he went into Potiphar's household and God raised him up and made him uh, the highest servant. And then he was falsely accused of something by Potiphar's, Potiphar's wife. And so he was thrown in jail and then he, made, he did well in jail. But it wasn't until he finally was able to interpret Pharaoh's dreams that there was going to be these seven years of famine coming. But before that, there were seven years of prosperity. And so Pharaoh elevated Joseph to the highest point in Egypt. And eventually, God provided through Joseph being there to save the nation of Israel. Because of the famine that came, Israel, Jacob, and his sons had to come to Egypt. And there was reconciliation and all those things. And in Genesis 50, Joseph summarizes it. He says, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. He reassured them and spoke kindly to them. And so now the nation of Israel is in Egypt, just as God had foretold to Abraham. And in the beginning, they were very prosperous. It says in Exodus 1 that Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came into power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. <coughs> Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put masters over them to oppress them with labor. As time passes... God continues to bless the Israelites, and the Egyptians get scared. So they put them into slavery. And I don't know if the, if the Israelites were the ones that built the pyramid, but that's what I have for that season. But then the Israelites started to cry out. It says the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God, and God heard their groaning. He remembered the covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. All during this time, God was working his plan. The Pharaoh had ordered the murder of Egyptian male babies, but God saved Moses. And Moses ended up being raised by the Pharaoh's daughter. And as he grew up as an adult, he saw the oppression that his people had, and he responded one day in anger, and he killed an Egyptian, an Egyptian slave driver. And, and then he had to flee, and he, he fleed away, and he got married, and he became a shepherd, and time passed, and yet God met him in a burning bush and told him, I want you to go back to Egypt. I want you to free your people. But Moses... I was like, nope, not me, God. I mean, you realize, like, I'm like the worst, right? I can't talk. You want someone to go talk to, to, the, to the Egyptian pharaoh, and do and you realize what my past is there? Probably not the best place to go. Do you, do you realize that I'm not qualified? Send somebody else. And finally, in anger, God says, look, I'll give you Aaron to, to talk for you, but go back. 
But how often are we like Moses? God, I don't have the skills. I mean, yesterday when we were going and talking to these, these different people, I'm like, God, I don't know Bengali. I don't know how to speak Yemeni. I don't know how to speak Arabic. I'm knocking on their doors. Some are like looking at me like I don't speak English. And I'm like, well, that's fine because I don't speak Bengali, so we're just going to smile at each other. Bengali, okay. I keep talking to them. Bengali, oh, okay, no speak English? Okay, thank you. Okay, here's a track in your language. I don't know what it says, but John handed it to me, so it's probably good stuff. There you go. So, but we are often like Moses. We, God tells us to do something. We're like, well, I'm not the right person, right? I'm not, I'm not the one that has those skills. I'm not the one who you should use. But God did. God, God sent Moses back to Egypt, and he went to Pharaoh. He said, let my people go, and, and Pharaoh wouldn't budge. And so there were ten different plagues, and plague after plague after plague, and then it finally came to the tenth one. And we have a foreshadowing again. God told the Israelites, Here, here's what you do. The angel of death is going to come through this camp, and it's going to kill the firstborn of all the Egyptians' household. But if you... You, have this, you slaughter this lamb, you put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of the house, and you have this meal, this Passover meal. The angel will pass over your house. The sacrifice will cover your sins. The sacrifice will be a temporary covering for you so that you will not experience this death. And so they did, and there was even some Egyptians that, that followed suit too. And God kept them safe, and, and so then after that happened, then... Pharaoh was very angry, so he sent them away. But then after their distance off, he, he remembers and he gets more angry. He says, look, i got an army. These guys don't have an army. Let's go kill them. And he chases after the nation of Israel, and they're stuck in between the cloud and the waters, and God parts the sea. And I've always wondered what that would look like. I, you know, that's from the old movie, but some of the newer ones are different. But God parts the Red Sea, and a million people slowly cross this sea. And then after they're across, God removes the cloud, and the, and the Egyptians come in, the army comes in, and God allows the water to crash to defeat the army. God protects the Israelites. But while they're on the other side, do they go, ha, perfect. We know now God is always going to provide for us. We're going to be happy. We know God has a plan. Look at how God has saved us. Well, we find that's not really the case. But before we get to that, God also gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments. And the first four were all about loving God. and It was about loving God, putting God above all else, not having any other idols, keeping the Sabbath day holy, not using God's name in vain. And these other six were all about how we love others. That's why Jesus summarized the law in those two things, love God Love others. Those first four, the foundational, are about loving God. The rest are about how we interact with others. But even while Moses was up there getting these commandments from God, the nation of Israel was like, he's taking too long. What do we do? Well, shouldn't we do something? Shouldn't we get an idol? And so they tell Aaron, we need an idol. And Aaron gets an idol to worship God, which is a weird thing to do. And, and when Moses comes down, he's so upset and he goes to Aaron and says, what happened? And Aaron pulls a, a, a kid move, right? I don't know what happened. You know, they gave me all the earrings and stuff, and I put them in the fire, and this cow just popped out. You know, have you guys ever had your, you know, taught, you, you find out your kids is doing something, you, you question them, I don't know what happened. All I did was put stuff in the fire. Somehow this cow came out per, 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 perfectly formed. And so they were again punished because idolatry crept in, as it always does in the life of the Israelites. But also during that season, as they're heading to the promised land, uh, they built a tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, they would make sacrifices. The sacrifices would cover their sins. And, and even to the point where there was this one day during the year called the Day of Atonement. And during the Day of Atonement, what would happen is they would have two lambs. And one, one they would kill as a sacrifice to, to take on the sins, but the other one, they would lay their hands on it and they would send it out into the wilderness as a sign of God sending the sins of the Israelites far away from the nation of Israel. Once again, foreshadowing what needed to happen. But as the Israelites arrived at the doorstep of the promised land, they sent 12 slaves out into the promised land. And of those 12 slaves, 10 of them 
said, yes, the land is wonderful, it's amazing, the fruit's awesome, but their cities are fortified and their people are huge, there's no way we can have victory. But there's two, Joshua and Caleb, who say, no, if God wants us to have it, we can have it. God has planned this for us. So because of their doubt, and they actually were so afraid that they said this, if only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Do we ever think that way? The old sin that didn't satisfy us, those old habits that didn't work back then, but we get in a tough spot, we think, well, I'll just go back to what used to work, even though we realize it didn't work at all. Like in that time, we knew it wasn't working, but we just continued to go back to it, thinking, well, this other thing is too difficult, so I go back to what worked, but it's something that didn't work. So because of their sin and because of their lack of faith, they were denied. I can't read it, it says denied. And they had to wander in the desert, or desert, desert, for 40 years. And the only people from that group that actually were able to head into the promised land were Joshua and Caleb. And so the time came after 40 years of wandering for Joshua. I don't think he had a sword like this. But anyways, I'll turn it off. That's distracting. For Joshua to take and lead the nation of Israel into the promised land, back into the promised land. And so God said to be strong and courageous. Be very strong and courageous. And in fact, God went before him. So they came to this huge place called Jericho. And they didn't even go and attack it. God said to walk around seven times. And then God caused, just in case you were asleep, there we go. God caused Jericho, the walls, to fall down and they entered the promised land. And God blessed, God blessed Joshua. In every place he put his foot, they had victory. But then after Joshua, they got caught in this cycle, this cycle of sin. And judges, what we see is that they would worship God and they'd be prosperous. And when they were prosperous, they'd kind of lose sight of things and they'd start to worship false idols. And they worship false idols. Then what would happen is then God would lift his hand of protection on the nation. And then four nations would come in and be victorious. And the Israelites would cry out and they'd cry out, God, please come and save us. And they repent of their sins or repent of their idolatry. And God would raise up a judge to bring them freedom. And then they'd be prosperous again. And this happened time and time again. When we look at our lives, I think often we can easily get stuck in that cycle too. Where things are going well, we lose sight of who God is. And we, we might not worship other idols, but we start to give other things priority over God. We start to give other things preference. And it isn't until oftentimes a wake-up call happens, something bad happens, something difficult happens, someone gets sick that we go, oh man, I need to repent, I need to turn back to God. And then God brings about restoration. But then when we have a time of blessing again, we tend to easily slide into those things. And so the nation... God had given them Samuel, but they rejected the prophet, and they said, we want a king. <coughs> and so they chose, they wanted a king who was, looked like a king and acted like a king. And Saul was a tall man. He was handsome. He was someone that everybody would think would be the perfect king. But we see that he fell short. And even though he looked the part on the outside, he didn't fit the part on the inside. And so God took the crown away from Saul and gave it to David. Now David was called a man after God's own heart. What's amazing about that is that David was a flawed individual. One time when David was supposed to be away at war, he was instead at home and he was on his roof and he was looking out and on another roof, I don't know why they had baths on roofs, but that was what they did back then. There was an attractive lady taking a bath on another roof. And he goes, hey, to his servant, who is that girl over there? Well, that's Uriah's wife. Well, Uriah was one of his mighty men. So he should have said, wow, I shouldn't be looking at that. Instead, he said, hey, bring her to me. And David had an affair with Bathsheba, and she got pregnant. Now what do you do? Well, I mean, you could fess up, but instead he... He said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a trick. So he, he brought Uriah back home from the battle. He tried to get him drunk. And, hey, you go sleep with your wife. But Uriah said, no, I'm not going to do that when the rest of my army is out there. 
because Uriah was a righteous man. And so instead, David had Uriah sent to the front lines and had the army pull back so Uriah would surely die, and then he took Bathsheba as his own wife. And in that midst of that sin, he didn't realize what he was doing. Sometimes we get so desensitized by sin, we don't even recognize how far we've gone. And Nathan the prophet confronted him, and he finally realized what he had done. And he came to a place of brokenness, and he, he cried out to God, and he asked for repentance. When I think of a man after God's own heart, I think the reason why David was able to keep that title is because when he recognized that he was living in sin, he turned back to God, because we're all sinners. I'm thankful that I haven't done something like that, but I'm thankful that God continues to welcome me back when I mess up. But there were consequences to what David did, but at the same time, that seed that we'd seen throughout, God makes a promise in 2 Samuel 7, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build the house for my name, and I will establish his throne forever. The Davidic promise that there will be a coming king, a forever king, a forever Messiah. And so David passed on his lineage to Solomon, and Solomon could have asked God for anything, and he asked God for wisdom, and so God made him the wisest man on the earth, and, and God blessed the nation of Israel. It was the biggest they ever became, and there was peace during his whole reign, peace. But Solomon didn't follow what Deuteronomy 17 had said to follow. Deuteronomy 17 said a king shouldn't acquire a great number of horses for himself, shouldn't acquire many wives, or his heart will be led astray, shouldn't acquire large amounts of silver and gold, and Solomon did all three of those things. And in fact, his wives were the ones that said, hey, can we, can we build you know, an, 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 a place to worship our gods back there? Sure. And then Solomon fell into idol worship. But instead of God taking the kingdom from Solomon, Solomon said, because of the faithfulness of your father, David, I won't take it from you, but I will rip it from your son. And so during his son Rehoboam's reign, the nation of Israel was divided Idolatry was prevalent in the northern Israel. Bad king after bad king after bad king until the point in 722 B.C. uh, God caused the Assyrians to come in and to conquer Israel. Judah had good kings and bad kings, more bad kings than good kings, but times where they they would go back to God's ways. And in 586 B.C., the Babylonians came in and, and conquered Judah and, and took what the people of Babylon would do when they conquered an area is they'd, they'd get some people from another area, put them in the area they conquered, and they'd take all the, the military leaders and all the wise men and all the, the esteemed people out of the nation so that those that were left would intermingle with the others. They'd lose their national identity, and those that were the leaders would go to Babylon and they'd be trained and they'd be, they'd be uh, basically indoctrinated with the Babylon ways. But God even allowed the nation of Israel to flourish while they were in exile. We have some stories of that, like Daniel, who was in the lion's den. I didn't have a lion other than this. But Daniel stayed true, stayed faithful. And then the Persians came in and and defeated the Babylonians. And the Persians allowed Daniel to have a place of prominence. And the Persians actually allowed the Israelites to go back home to rebuild the wall and rebuild the temple. And I did miss in here that Solomon built the temple, a place of worship. And then when they returned, they were able to rebuild the walls and rebuild the temple. And then the Bible in Malachi 4 talks about this time after they were in exile and they returned. Well, before we get to that, sorry. In Jeremiah 31, there was a new covenant, a new promise So this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. A coming promise that would be fulfilled through Christ. The end of the New Testament in Malachi 4. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left of them, but for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and and frolic like well-fed calves. 
Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees that I have gave him in Horeb at Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. And that's the end of the Old Testament. And the nation of Israel waited 400 years of silence, hoping But what they were waiting for was a king, a military ruler, someone to come and and have victory. See, during that time, Alexander the Great came through and conquered, and then when he died, he split up the kingdom between different generals, and up in the north, you had the Seleucids, in the south, the Ptolemies, and they would fight, and between them was Israel, so there's all these battles going on, and Israel kept losing their independence, and then uh, when when they celebrate Hanukkah, it celebrates the time that they were actually victorious, and they got their nation back, and they rededicated the temple. And then there was some conflict among the Jewish leaders, and they said to, to Rome, hey, can you help us figure out who's in charge? And Rome said, sure, we are. And they came in, and Rome took over. And now we come to the time of Jesus, and everybody is expecting a Messiah, but the Messiah, was, in their mind, was going to be a king. He was going to be a political ruler. He was going to be a leader of an army. And yet it was Jesus. It wasn't what they expected. The Son of God, whose purpose was to come and die. He came as a suffering servant. He came with the sole purpose of dying on the cross for our sins. He was that promised seed. But they didn't know what the promise truly was. Isaiah 53 talks about Jesus like this. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like before them like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing is in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering, familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, each of us have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And it goes on to describe perfectly Jesus. They didn't realize that all this time it was pointing toward a suffering servant. And as Jesus was crucified on the cross, He says something really simple. My God, my God, why have You forsaken Me? Now for us, we hear that word and that doesn't register anything for us because we have chapters and verses and things in the Bible. But for a Jewish speaker, instead of saying, turn to Psalm 22... They would start quoting it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in their mind they would go, okay, I know that one. Right? What, what was that one about? When Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What was he, what was he saying? Psalm 22, David writes this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out to you by day, but you do not answer. By night I, do, I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises, and your ancestors, and you, our ancestors, put their trust. They trusted you, and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved, for they were trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by all the people. All who see me mock me. As Jesus stood, was on the cross, they were mocking him. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. They say, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Why don't you if, you, if you really are the Son of God, come down. Skip forward to verse 14. I am poured out like water, and all my bo- bones are out of joint. When someone's crucified, the bones would be pulled out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. When we stabbed, he had the water and the blood separated. 
My mouth is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of the death. He was thirsty. Dogs surrounded me. Gentiles were called dogs. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. This whole story was pointing to one event. See, when we look at the story, we realize something. Realize just like Adam and Eve, we have pride. And we want to be just like God. And just, just like the, the people at Babel, you know, we, we want to be like God. We, we, want all the, we want to be famous. We see, just like the nation of Israel, we, we grumble and we complain and we're, we're ungrateful. And we see, just like, just like the, the nation of Israel and judges, we, we continue to go back and fall back to our old sins. Just like David, we might not have committed adultery or murder, but Jesus says that if you've ever hated someone, you've committed murder. If you ever lust after someone, you've committed adultery. And so our hate and our lust. And all throughout the Old Testament, we see is time and time again, God has to provide a sacrifice. And it's only temporary. So at Genesis 3, we see God provides a sacrifice to, to give them clothes to cover their sin and shame. And, 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 and we see again here with, 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 uh, with Abraham and Isaac that, that God provides the ram in the thicket as a substitute in the place of Isaac. And, and we see it again at the temple where they would, they would kill the, 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 the animal and send the other one off to make temporary atonement for their sins. And all this is pointing to the Lamb, Jesus who came. When Jesus died on the cross, what He offered was to take our place. So then, He took our pride, our desire to be famous, our ungratefulness, our, our sins, our, our hate, our lust, and all those sins were put on Him. And if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and we give our life to Him, what He does is He no longer holds them on our account. They were paid for by the cross. The moment that Jesus died on the cross, if we put our faith and trust in Him, those sins were nailed to the cross. They are no more. So this whole beautiful story is pointing to the need. God created us to be in a relationship with Him, but our sins, our sins, they separate us from God. And those sins can't be paid for by sacrifices or by doing good deeds because we're always going to fall short. We're always going to make mistakes. We're always going to sin. And so Jesus came and paying the price for our sin, Jesus died. But if he just died, it wouldn't be enough. So on the third day, the stone was rolled away and he raised again. And he offers us life with him, but that life starts now and lasts forever. So after he died and after he ascended, he gave us the church. And we no longer had to go to a tabernacle to see his presence. In fact, the church is us. It's not a building it's us as believers, and God has given us His very presence. So we don't need to go to a tabernacle to make sacrifices. We have the Holy Spirit if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And God has called us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Yes, I stole my son's toy. And these are really difficult, by the way. Way more difficult than they were when I was a kid. But we're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We're to live our lives in the hope of what's coming. Because someday, in a flash... In the blink of an eye, that's flash, by the way. In the blink of an eye, Jesus will return and the dead in Christ will rise and those of us who are faith, faith in Jesus will go up into heaven. Wow, that was not planned. Sorry, Chris. But in the flash of an eye and then during that time after we're, after we're raptured, there will be a time of tribulation and, and there will be an antichrist who comes who's to bring balance to the force. No, not really. Uh, that's Anakin. And, and the Antichrist will come and everybody will think he's the one. He's the one to unite and bring peace. And then people will, will start to put the sign of the beast on them. It won't look like that probably. 
But they'll have the sign of the beast, but it's going to turn out that the Antichrist is actually not good. And it's going to turn out that he is actually leading people the wrong path. And then at that time, instead of here, Jesus came as a sacrifice, he came as an offering, he's going to come back as king. He's going to come with a sword. He's going to come and he's going to rule for a thousand years. And if you haven't put your faith and trust in Christ, there will be a final day of judgment. A final day of judgment, you will have two options. You will either, as we said yesterday when we were out, be in Gehenna, in hell, or in paradise, heaven. And if we are faithful, he will give us a reward and say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. And we will spend eternity with God in the new heavens and the new earth. And that's the big picture. And sometimes we look back at the Old Testament, that's, that's not that, you know, it's not that important. It's good stories. But really, the Old Testament is our story of how we continually seek on our own to find satisfaction, of how we continually seek our own to atone for our sins, about how we try to live a good life but always fall short. But at all points, from the very beginning, from that first seed in Genesis 3, toward the redeeming Savior that would come and be the sacrifice so we don't have to earn our way to heaven because we can't. God is perfect and holy and the sacrifice is the only way and Jesus provided that sacrifice. He was the lamb that was slain on our behalf. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I thank you that you love us. And God, if there's anyone here who has never put their faith and trust in you, I pray that today they will see their need for a Savior. That they will see their need for a sacrifice. That they may try to do things on their own. They may try to do enough good works, but those will never add up. But it's only because you came and offered your free gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. God, help us to live in light of that today. Help us to remember your sacrifice and help us to follow you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.